Hello, welcome to this evening's Mansfield Public Talk. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Helen Mountfield. I'm the principal at Mansfield College. And this evening we have a speaker who seems to me to be particularly important um, for a college like Mansfield that tries to bridge um, divides in society and include people in conversations and debate. We seem to live in times when there are um, those who would start, stoke up culture wars between um, people who um, promote free speech and free exchange of ideas and people who um, say that we should have uh, safe spaces where some things are not up for grabs. And we are interested in an environment where ideas can be shared, even contentious ideas, um, freely, um, but we are also respectful of other people. So this evening, we're very um, pleased to welcome um, our speaker, Mickey um, Scott Bay Jones. Mickey, great to see you um, coming to us from, from Tennessee. So great, <laughs> fantastic, thank you very much. Um, uh, Mickey is, um, well, shall we explain to you what she's about? She's about the idea of brave spaces. And she is the director of Resilience and the Resilience and Healing Initiative at the Faith Matters Network, which again, she will explain to us. And she's also um, the person who offers vision and leadership to the daring chaplaincy movement. So I'm very delighted to welcome you, uh, Mickey. I think with your chapter on brave spaces hot off the presses in the book called Holding Change by um, Adrienne Mary Brown, which I think you received today. So it's great to see you. Thank you very much. Um, just to say, we will, uh, Mickey will probably speak for about um, half an hour, perhaps a little more. And when she's done that, um, we will open a discussion and please do um, engage in that debate using the Q&A function on Zoom. And it'd be great to have your observations, comments, questions. So Mickey, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Helen. I appreciate that introduction. Um... And thank you all for being with us um, today. And I'm going to talk for a little bit, um, and then hopefully we can have a little bit of discussion. Um, so, and and realizing that what the kinds of things I'm saying may be new to you, there may be things that deeply resonate with you, um, and, but maybe you've not had the language for it before. Um, and so I invite you to sit with that, to be open with that um, as we have this conversation. So I'd like to begin with a reading of An Invitation to Brave Space, my poem. Together, we will create brave space because there is no such thing as a safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we have all caused wounds. In this space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify the voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. This space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our brave space together and we will work on it side by side. My name is Mickey Scott Bay Jones, and I am the Justice Doula. And there are many things that I can call myself, many ways that I am called, um, be that mother or sister, friend, um, doula, movement chaplain, and when it comes down to it, my work in the world is nurturing and supporting change makers and the work of change in the world. I am deeply curious about how we actually get to more freedom, 
more love, more liberation in our world. Um, and so that's what I spend my time uh, working on and supporting. And so in that, I've thought a lot about what it takes for us to achieve change, what it takes for us to work together to build a world that allows all of us to flourish, that allows all of us, as many of us as possible, to feel loved, to feel secure, to feel um, as if we have what we need to survive and to thrive. And so I think about these ideas of safety, these ideas of courage and bravery. Um, and so I've been thinking about it um, lately because I'm actually trying to write a lot of these thoughts down into a, into a book. Um, and I thought about this movie that I had remembered from a long time ago, from 2001. Um, and it was about this boy who lived in a bubble called Bubble Boy. And it's a comedy, but it's this, the premise is that there's this baby that's born without really a functional immune system. And so his parents build this world for him with, that's essentially in a bubble. He lives in a dome inside of their house and he never goes outside. They um, even, they don't even touch him. They do everything they need to do for him and with him through this bubble. Um, and their idea is to create this world where nothing can touch him and therefore nothing can harm him. No germs, no viruses. And even they wanna keep him from ideas, right? So they actually raise him only with Highlights Children's Magazine. If you, if you ever read Highlights as a kid, you know, it had like the puzzles and games in it and cute little articles. Um, and the movie Land of the Lost. So he's untouched in his dome, um, in his room. He is protected and he is risk-free and he is safe. And it got me thinking about what do we actually want when we create spaces of safety? What is it that we're actually going for? Who are we keeping safe? And who are we being kept safe from? And what do we even mean when we use the word safe? The, the, de the dictionary definition, which, you know, that's only one way to look at a definition of a word, right? Words come to have cultural meaning. Um, they uh, come to have slang meaning, right? Social meanings. But kind of if you go back to that, you know, the, what you'll find in any kind of dictionary is that safety or safe is this idea of being free from risk, from danger, from harm or damage. But it can also mean that we, that something or someone is unlikely to harm another, right? So it's both this kind of safety from and safety um, to. And Bubble Boy's life was free of risk right, as uh, free of danger, harm, damage. But as he began, but until he began to risk some danger, the movie follows him as he goes out into the world, of course, right, and has all these adventures. Um, and as he begins to risk, um, he is actually able to grow. Without that, he was, he was unable to grow up, to learn more truth. Uh, to change or to be a part of the change in the world. And the story told in the movie, which I don't necessarily recommend the movie, it's not actually that great. <laughs> um, but we can learn something from Bubble Boy. And that is that change requires us to be brave. You know, there are times when you seek and need the most safety that you can get. Uh, you know, as we know, there are things like tornadoes, fires, COVID, that are no respecters of person. So we cannot ever be 100% safe because there are natural disasters. There are microscopic organisms that can take us out. Um, and there are times when protection from harm 
and getting as close to zero risk is our goal and a worthy one. We've all been living through this time where we had to continue to have this constant evaluation of is what we're doing safe? Is it at least safer? What's the physical risk to my body to be in, in the room that I'm in? The risk of being maskless? What's the psychological risk of being in my house one more day? Right, we've had this very intense time of navigating risk. Um, and many of us have lost a lot. Um, I personally have suffered the loss of my own mother during this time to COVID. And I have had, a, I feel like a heightened sense of the risk of this disease, seeing it ravage my own mother's body and then take her life. And we've, we've learned a lot. Um, I have learned a lot of lessons during this time. And we've come to understand how profoundly exhausting it is to constantly focus on this idea of safety. It's necessary and good, but it also can be helpful to reframe and to have a focus on what we can control. Um, and what we can control is how we come to the situation. So creating brave space is primarily a framework for spaces, not all spaces, spaces that are intentionally, purposefully, spaces of growth, of change, of mutual support, of care and collective social change or collective struggle. So I'm not talking about your average dance club or grocery store where literally anything can happen, right? You can only control for so much in kind of open spaces. I'm talking about places where you're opting in, right? So, you know, like an environmental justice club or your social justice collective, or maybe you have an artist collaborative um, where you make music together or paint together. Uh, or perhaps a faith community or spiritual practice community. Uh, maybe you have a, a meditation group, uh, or maybe you formed a nonprofit or even a college campus, right? Any place where you have opted in for change, for growth and for collective flourishing, where you're trying to create community and in particular community that can be engaged in some sort of um, personal and individual change and collective change, where you wanna see each other um, become more human and, in, and even increase the humanity in the world. So when you're trying to birth something new into the world, you do need that physical safety, yes, and you need to be brave. Now I'm a former birth doula, um, and a doula is kind of like a birth coach, not quite a midwife, right? Midwives keep everybody alive in the situation. That's how I describe it. And doulas are more of the support person that is there alongside the birthing person and their family as uh, during the whole birthing process, right? And, and sometimes afterwards. And so, so much of what I learned as a doula in this, uh, in, in the world of helping families uh, birth for over a decade um, is that in times of, of birthing, um, those times of becoming, right? You're going from um, maybe not a parent to a parent, right? You're birthing this new being into the world. Um, those times require you to breathe, right? To pause, to take deep breaths, and to be in touch with your body and your location in space. They require a push, right? Sometimes you have to exert more energy. They require changing positions and, and birthing uh, an actual baby, that means physical, but in the realm of change, of birthing something new into the world, new ideas, new ways of being together, that also requires changing positions. It requires walking and yelling and moaning and singing 
and sighing and learning and leaning on one another. All of that is also required in birthing you as a new person, birthing more justice into the world as well. So I am gonna read now a little bit from Holding Change, which is brand new, just came out, and I just got my copy as well. Um, and this um, is a, a book that's by Adrian Marie Brown that I um, have an essay in. It is called Holding Change, The Way of Emergent Strategy Facilitation and Mediation. Um, and it's in the Emergent Strategy series. And if you haven't heard of Adrienne, she's phenomenal. Um, <clears throat> her work is really popular in the US. I don't know if it's made it to the UK yet, but um, her, her book, Emergent Strategy, talked about kind of um, how we use this idea of emergent strategy in our movements um, here in the US and was prime, it's, it's, you know, how do we actually make social change um, in ways that are, um, that actually uh, incorporate how we learn and change and grow, right? Um, and this book is more about the facilitation process. If you're actually trying to facilitate whether that's a transformative justice process, whether that's um, uh, spaces of, of kind of popular education or um, even classrooms and learning and, you know, how do we actually um, work together and build community in ways that um, are places where everyone can thrive. So, of course, my chapter is on um, Brave Space. And um, it has the poem that I just read in it, but I'm going to share a little bit um, from my essay that accompanies the poem. This is some of what has surfaced for me while exploring the practice of inviting myself and others into creating brave, space, brave spaces. Brave space that we carry within and brave space that we practice with others. Spaces that are not just safe, which feels so fragile and precarious to maintain, but spaces that also encourage us to be very in touch with our needs and our energy, to give as we are able, to heal ourselves as we offer healing to each other in the world, and to practice in ways that open up possibilities of transformation. Creating, safe space, creating spaces that are safe is admirable and, our addiction to safety, which I sometimes wonder if it's more about comfort, lack of conflict, or a desire to set it and forget it containers, has at times devolved into long periods of agreement setting and developing a list of rules for every possible way of relating to one another, where the focus is more on the policing of tone, language, and surface level behavior that makes performative participation easier and vulnerable participation more difficult. The framework of inviting each other into brave spaces is at its core, a baseline agreement to be authentic, in authentic working relationship. <clears throat> its focus is on becoming skillful and navigating the messiness of different starting points, divesting from, from perfection, working at the speed of relationship, attending to our own frustrations and practicing accountability, transformative justice, repair, and even separation in generative ways that create more liberation in the midst of work, not just as a result of it. So when you are birthing something new, when you are changing from one state to another, when you are making a new way, you cannot be closed and protected. You must have an open stance. An open stance allows you to be heart led. That means checking in with yourself, with your needs, your energy, your ability to work from strength, not deficit. Being heart led allows you to engage with clarity and honesty, 
saying what is true with the intent of mutual flourishing and not harm for the other person. It, it means that we must be creative. It doesn't mean that, every, that anything and everything goes. Okay, so this is not that everyone just gets to do and say whatever they want and we don't actually care about how people are being treated in a space. It, what we know, what I know from being a birth doula is that when someone enters the room who is aggressive, combative, disrespectful, birth can and will literally stop. I mean, contractions go away and the baby is left up inside of the birthing person. And that's not getting any of us what we want. We wanna see this new being birthed into the world. And it's the same when we're trying to learn something new, get new ideas on the table. Um, brave spaces are intentionally welcoming, hospitable, radically hospitable. Um, co-created by those who participate. Do we feel like we're all creating this space together? That's important in this idea of brave space. Um, they are opt in, right? So people are, be, are participating because they want to, because they're opting in. Um, these spaces make room for joy, for lament, for mistakes, for learning, for accountability, uh, and they are spacious enough to allow time for all of these things. All of these things take time and cannot really be rushed. So admittedly, brave spaces take work because they're dynamic. They require communication and commitment and learning. Even facilitators will always be co-learners in a brave space. You will not always be able to facilitate and cultivate brave space within yourself. There are times when we are not at our best. And what is actually brave is to admit that and to, to do the work to take care of yourself so that you can come back into the space willing and able to participate. You will not always be able to cultivate brave space with other people. There are times when the tension is too high when the topic is too hot, when things need some time to cool before they can be handled. So let me give you some sketches of what I've seen in kind of what I consider safe spaces and brave spaces. Understanding that I'm not proposing a binary here, like on one end safe space and on one end is brave space. Um, but I'm proposing that we can actually feel safer um, and feel more purposeful and powerful if we loosen that grip on the need for kind of this ex externally created safety, um, which I think sometimes what we mean is comfort, right? Um, but we can cultivate our own kind of courage and heart leadership um, and we will actually get more done and have deeper impact when we cultivate brave space inside and in community. So sometimes what I've seen with um, safe spaces is that they can either be or include um, this kind of behavior focus, right? We're very focused on, are we saying the right things? Um, are we using the right words? Um, are we kind of, um, you know, all, behaving in the right way, right? Instead of kind of a complicated, people are coming in at different entry points. Um, we see this a lot in language currently, right? Um, because depending on where you've grown up or what you've been taught or what kind of communities you've been a part of, right? Um, you may not be as familiar with um, kind of using different pronouns or even stating your pronouns, right? Now, sometimes we go around and we have an introduction and say your name and your pronouns, you, you can see that 
um, with where my name is listed, I, I, I list my pronouns as well. And so what I've seen sometimes is as this, as an introduction happens in a circle is that people who don't, are, who aren't used to this practice um, may say something that um, isn't just she and he and them, or even um, kind of these proto pronouns of like Z and Zer, they may say we, because I believe we're all one people or whatever, right? And that can kind of strike people in different ways, right? Is that person trying to be obstinate? Are they trying to be difficult? Um, are they confused? Um, and so that can kind of become a sticking point of its own because if people don't know why that's a thing or why it's important to this particular group or we haven't kind of discussed it as a group, it can sort of become um, a, well, that person obviously doesn't know or you know, can be an, an in or out thing when it can, when it doesn't have to be that, right? It could be an invitation to think about things like gender um, and, how we address each other, how important it is to, to respect someone's name and how they wanna be addressed, right? Like it doesn't have to be a point of contention, but sometimes in spaces that have said, we're going to be safe at all costs, this becomes a thing um, that is then layered with other accusations or, or pain points when, um, sometimes it's more of a point of learning, right? We have to actually be able to distinguish between when someone is purposefully being aggressive or rude or, or harmful and when someone is at a different starting point or point along their learning than other people. Um, often again in safe spaces, there is this outside control, as I've mentioned. Um, it can be more about shared belief than relationship. Um, and, and sometimes the relationships aren't that great, but we're all here because we have said we all believe the same things. Um, again, it can be about comfort, right, um, over actual growth um, and a focus on perfection, right? You have to do everything the right way, the first way or not at all. Um, and kind of a... Um, a skewing towards disposability and fragility, right? So that again, anyone who can't kind of immediately meet the social norms or um, uh, frameworks of the group is, 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 is asked to leave um, without any kind of, um, you know, questions or ability to, to discern what's actually happening within that person or within the group. Um, what I see in brave spaces, uh, as far as what can be happening there and what is often included, is there's a real focus on kind of an internal sense of control, right? Um, and internal understanding of concepts versus things being, um, from the outside. Um, so I'm gonna talk about people's suppers in a second, um, but I have, I have participated in and led in people's suppers from uh, all over the US. And, um, and these are suppers that uh, we started in 2016 after that election. Um, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit deeper what they were, but of course the point was we had both healing suppers and bridging suppers. So bringing people together that were either kind of of similar group um, and doing some healing work and people that were wanting to bridge across divides. Um, and I did a particular supper where um, the way these work is that people are, we ask people questions, there's a facilitator at a table, people ask, um, at their table, people ask questions or ask questions by the facilitator and they're, they're asked to share their story. These are not questions about what you believe or don't believe. These are questions about stories from your life, right? Um, because it's one thing to argue about facts or topics, 
but a person's experience is their experience. Um, and how they understand it happened to them is how it happened to them. So um, there was one particular supper, it was in a church in California. And uh, I think the question was something about what's, tell us about a time that something happened um, that made you hopeful right now. What's something that's giving you hope right now? And a woman told a story about how she had gone to a march, I think it was uh, a women's march in uh, you know, her local area with her husband and her child and just the, it gave her so much hope to see them together and see her husband with her daughter and it was a women's march and you know, just all of these wonderful feelings of how um, equality for women is becoming a thing, right? And she was just really explaining her experience of how that felt for her, how that gave her hope personally. And another woman at the table um, became, it looked as if she was agitated. And her response was, well, I just think that's chaos. There's just too much chaos happening. And and, and I just, these marches make me very uncomfortable. And, and I, as the facilitator of that table, I, um, I reminded her, I tried to bring her back to the question, which was what's giving you hope right now? This is what she's telling us, this other person is telling us what's giving her hope right now. So, when it's your turn, I want you to tell us what's giving you hope right now, right? So I was calling her back to herself and asking her to kind of regroup. She's allowed to have her feelings, but what we're doing in that moment is talking about what's giving her hope right now. Everyone gets to share that. Um, you don't get to argue with what's bringing someone else hope. <laughs> she gets to tell her story, right? Um, and so we're asking people to do the internal work of, of, of wrestling with when, when those feelings come up, right? And not just um, doing what we normally do, which is we often ask a question so that we can answer it, right? We ask someone for their story so that we can then tell the story after they're done, or we can now give them our advice after they're done. And participating in something where that, where you're not just listening to wait for your turn, but you're actually listening to the other person's story, that is a different kind of, of discipline, a different kind of way of interacting with other people um, that doesn't allow you as much to stay only within your own uh, talking points, right? Because it's not about talking points and about arguing who's right and who's wrong. So that it, so it's also just very story based, um, and it, again, which then leads us into relationship over shared belief, right? We're what we're interested in is the relationships in the room, um, the human beings in the room, um, and in the work together, and that becomes our um, our higher goal. Um, there is also um, a centering of the most vulnerable or most impacted. Um, and when I say that, understand that I'm not saying that that means some people don't matter. Um, I think what we, what we know is that if the most vulnerable are cared for, that that care ripples out to everyone else. A really easy way to understand this is that if you have an environment that's um, that offers a lot of care and respect for children, right? It's a it's a it's a space that that children can thrive in, right? There are snacks and water and um, a pace uh, and a um, an environment that allows for for noise and for you know the things that children need then it will be a space that is um, that offers more care for everyone that's in the space, right? And so that is the same for um, vulnerable or impacted people who are adults. There are often some people in the room 
that are more vulnerable in particular ways than others. And so what does it mean to actually um, care, make sure that their needs are, are taken care of, whether that's a disability, um, whether that's because they are um, a minority group that doesn't um, you know, have the same kind of movement and um, freedom in a particular culture. Um, any of that will, again, lead to protecting everyone in the room. Um, there, are, there can be discomfort in brave spaces because you're gonna be learning and changing. Um, you're going to be um, given feedback that can um, sometimes hurt because maybe it's something you didn't know you were doing or a place where a place of growth or skill development for you. Um, and I would say also this is a space that can that can be more intimate and also has accountability, right? So, um, and by accountability, I don't mean punishment. Um, I think now we're starting to sometimes conflate punishment and accountability. Um, accountability actually um, has to include connection. Right. For me to be accountable to you, I have to know you. You can't hold someone accountable that you don't know. Um, there's an abolitionist um, teacher in the US who talks about that, Miriam Kaba. And you have to actually be in, in relationship with someone to hold them account accountable. Um, and that also doesn't allow you to dispose of them. Um, it doesn't always mean that you'll remain in close relationship because sometimes the actually the best thing is for people to part ways. Um, but there are ways to do that that don't just throw that person away. So this concept of brave space um, was really honed during the work that my team and I did with the People Supper um, after the 2016 election of Donald Trump. Um, we developed this project called the People's Supper where we had tools and frameworks to help people gather around tables for a meal, Didn't, doesn't actually matter what meal it is, and listen to each other's stories. And this was a time when people were hurting and wounded and you just, you couldn't have a conversation anywhere without hearing that people were divided, right? This, these divisions in American society. <clears throat> and what happened through these suppers, which were hundreds of tables, um, thousands of people that engaged um, this work, and um, we still have materials up at thepeoplesupper.org, um, is that we found that people were brave enough to show up, not to share political opinions, not to try and sway each other to a particular way of thinking or believing, or set people straight, or tell them to get over themselves but people showed up to tell their own stories and to listen to other people tell their stories and to risk what can happen when you have an open-hearted stance with other humans that have also turned towards you, who have leaned in across the table to listen. And that was really the testing ground for Brave Space. And What's exciting is that soon you will be experiencing the People's Supper on your campus. Um, I believe plans are now being made to bring this methodology to you. We, we have information and guidebooks on peoplesupper.org. Those are available totally free. And we've, we have heard from so many people who literally downloaded a guidebook and had a supper in their dorm room or around their kitchen table or in their, at their community center. So you don't necessarily need special training, but you can get support from the People's Supper team. And so I'm glad that you, that you all will be um, getting that support. Um, but it's really about um, these things that I've been talking about today and about learning to listen, listen at those edges, not just for similarities, but for differences as well, and learning to hold those together. Um, and so you'll be able to explore um, talking about brave space in your organizations and clubs, wherever you are um, on your campus and, and even outside of that, you know, there may be a community group that you think would benefit from it too. 
um, and benefit from that gathering. We're kind of gonna have to relearn how to do all of this together um, as we're in space with each other more and more as the pandemic wanes. Um, so I would love to hear about it, how you um, explore Brave Space, how you gather together around tables to tell your stories. Um, and you can be in touch with me at faithmattersnetwork.org. Um, uh, and I would love to hear what you think. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mickey, for a fantastic um, and stimulating talk. Um, and do please ask any questions or make any observations you may have in the in the Q and A function, and I can put that to Mickey. Um, but if I can abuse my position as chair first, and, and <laughs> I've got a head full of ideas um, that I want to um, test um, about this, and just some of the kind of psychological, I suppose, and practical difficulties in. Uh, practicing this concept of brave space in so fearful and divided a society. And I was very struck by what you said about not skewing to fragility, but equally protecting those who appear to be the most vulnerable in a group. And one of the problems, it seems to me, is that in plenty of debates at the moment, lots of people perceive themselves to be the most vulnerable. We have you know and that happens with you know make america great again people who feel they have lost something when in any objective sense they are not the most vulnerable but they feel they are and how do we bridge that and get people to i suppose acknowledge some of their own strengths and privileges but equally to listen to other people's perceived vulnerabilities even if we don't immediately see them <laughs> yeah and feel them well i think you know it's not um everybody's work to do work together, right? So there's like, um, you don't have to necessarily do work with the most extreme opposites. You know what I'm saying? There are those special people that are made for that work. Um, you know, I think of my friends who are peacemakers in Israel, Palestine, right? Who literally sit down with people who, you know, whose families have hurt each other over years, you know? Um, I have been asked myself, oh, would you sit down with, with Donald Trump? Would you sit down with a white supremacist? Um, and you do hear those stories, right? Of people who that's their work, you know? Um, of, of someone who sits down with people that were in the Ku Klux Klan and uh, a black person who does that and like helps them come out of that, right? Um, but that is not everyone's work, right? So I think knowing what your um, both uh, kind of the way you, you know you're put together, right? How what your sensibilities are, um, what you feel called to do, as far as like, ooh, this really energizes me, or this feels like it's my work in the world. Um, then those people should absolutely do that. There is plenty of work that can be done in smaller um, kind of, uh, you know, people where the difference isn't that great, right? Where it's not necessarily an onstage debate between, you know, this far right person and this far left person, um, where you can have conversation with smaller groups of people. I mean, again, like these people suppers where we would bring people together who have all opted in and said, hey, we, are, we actually are, are wanting to have a conversation that feels a little difficult to have, where I do feel like I am risking being called something or being, um, having my feelings hurt or whatever. Um, and I think that those of us that facilitate spaces, whether it's teachers, whether it's you know, people who are just facilitating conversations, um, I think it's important to base our conversations in reality, right? Like it is, it is possible to respect someone's feelings and um, their experience without um, negotiating the facts, right? If we have factual information about um, how someone, uh, you know, how life expectancy is different among someone who's black versus white. That's not something debatable. That's just 
factual. Um, and so being able to, to still, um, you know, be based in reality while still keeping the humanity of participants front and center. Um, that's what a lot of transformative justice work is. It's not, it's not everybody gets to have their own version of everything that's ever happened. Um, but you do get to have your feelings and you do get to have your humanity. Um, and then from there, those who are willing to participate um, are able to move forward in participation. Yeah. And I suppose that those who are willing to participate, you, you, st you started off saying there are no absolutely safe spaces, but some people feel more vulnerable than others. And sometimes in the free speech debates um, in the UK, at least, you can feel that some people are asked, being asked to make more brave um, choices than others and hear more painful stuff than others. I mean, how, how do we negotiate that um, if you're having a debate, for example, to take two touch points that affect students here often, um, if you're having a debate about are you uh, pro-choice or pro-life, or if you're having a debate about um, uh, trans rights and whether you believe that somebody can change gender, which can be very wounding ideas for people to debate in both ways with profoundly held beliefs, which others feel attack them. How do we, how do we start that kind of discussion? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think part of it, it goes back to what I was saying is, um, we have to actually be clear on when someone is um, trying to cause harm um, or appears to be trying to cause harm versus someone who is curious, doesn't know, has, hasn't had the information yet, that kind of thing, right? Um, you know, someone who is purposefully using incor incorrect pronouns for someone isn't willing to actually participate in the conversation. Um, they are just, you know, they've decided that they're only going to be harmful to the other people in the room or the other people in the conversation, right? So um, I think also that's why Brave Space is about doing your own internal work at the same time as doing communal work. So internal work is saying, am I up for this conversation right now, right? So if, if, if you as a trans person are in a conversation with someone who is, a, is against trans rights, right? Like, are, is that the conversation you can have right now? Um, you know, there are people, there are trans people who are like, absolutely, that my work in the world is normalizing um, trans identity, and I am willing to have these conversations. I'm willing to, be, to debate people. I'm willing to, knowing that not everyone, not every trans person, that's their their work in the world. That's what they want to do. So they don't, ha you don't have to become the spokesperson for the thing if you're not, if that's not your thing. You may have individuals in your life, like you're doing the work by just be, continuing in relationship with your own family with your roommates, <laughs> with you know the people that you're close to. Um, and sometimes that's enough, right? Like just being with the people that you're closest to and then they, and it kind of can ripple out from there. Um, and so um, I think that, uh, you know, sometimes we will put people in a position, right? Of this happens sometimes in classrooms where there's a particular area of study, right? So maybe now we're gonna talk about Islam and there's one student in a hijab in the room and everybody, they expect that person to now be the spokesperson for Islam, right? And that's not fair to that person, right? So how do we um, you know, allow that person to tell us what their, you know, okay, I'm, I'm ready for this conversation today. I'm not ready for this conversation today. Um, again, I think you can have very clear kind of rules of engagement, right? Um, you can have questions, you can be very curious and real about things, um, 
but we're but there are ways to engage that are that are that are meant to be hurt, hurtful that are meant to harm and we all know that unless there's just something off about our humanity which for some people there is you know there are many ways that we're formed and you know but there can also be ways of if there is someone who's kind of a perpetual offender in that way um that they are you know still dealt with with the front with people who have the capacity to deal with that um and i think like in the us i don't you know i don't know everything about how free speech works there but we have a lot of confusion about what free speech is. Free speech doesn't actually mean you can say whatever you want, wherever you are all the time. Um, you know, people always say you can't yell fire in a you know crowded theater, right? Um, you can't slander someone, right? So there are limits to what you can say. Now you can say whatever you want to say in a classroom or as a, in a public speech or whatever, and free speech means that people have a right to give you their opinion back. So if people know what you say, right? If you're a known white supremacist, if you are known for hateful speech towards trans people or black people or towards whatever, towards any group, and you are giving a public talk, people absolutely have the right to say, we don't wanna to listen to that. Or we wanna offer a counter statement over here. We'll be out here protesting with a counter, with counter information, right? Like that is allowed. Um, and there are ways to do that so that we can still have all of those voices out there. Um, there are so many platforms now, you're never, your voice isn't taken away. You can just put it on Twitter or Facebook or start your own blog or like, you will still be able to say the things you wanna say and other people will also say what they wanna say um, in, in relationship to what you're saying, um, so. Cause you, you've said, and I understand this, that sometimes people set out to wound, but sometimes people perhaps they, they well people will describe as hate speech something which they found profoundly upsetting or offensive and which hurts them even if that is not the intention of the speaker That's so right. one of the questions here is do you think a brave space always needs a moderator who perhaps knows the intentions of the participants better than the participants themselves mm. well i don't i don't know that someone can know the uh intentions of someone better than they know mm. themselves that that's a that can be a difficult that would take some very intimate yeah. um, you know community to to be able to say that and i don't i don't know that that's possible mm -hmm. um but i do think depending on what it is facilitation can really help skillful facilitation can really help um and and skillful facilitation is different for different things right for for people supper i've trained people in five minutes before a supper begins because again, it's 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 always bringing people back to their story. Because um, it's so much more difficult to argue with someone's story. Um, you know, you can't say that didn't happen to you. Um, now, their interpretation of what happened to them might be off. Again, you might not know that though if you weren't there. Yeah. But it's still their story, and it's the way they understand it today, right? And so can even then continuing to be curious about that person's story um, versus needing to correct it can be helpful. So I think a facilitator who can do that kind of thing can always be helpful in a, in a conversation um, and, and keep us um, kind of going towards, again, if we're a group that's working together for something or, or that has decided to be in community together, it can help us, uh, a trained or uh, just a good facilitator can help us come, come back to that commitment of forming community together. Yeah. And do you think in, in that way, when we are speaking in a, in a community of this kind, even if what we perceive as our intention is not the way somebody else perceives it, um, when we are exercising this, this right to freedom of speech, we, 
need to take responsibility for what we say because increasingly in online communication the idea of free speech someone put this to, to you as a question someone you, you can say whatever you want but what is your responsibility for it so somebody's asked how might the idea of brave, brave spaces help us to reconnect these elements both our right to say things and i suppose our our moral duty to think about mm -hmm. the effect of what we say and how we say it yeah well, I think people are always responsible for what they've said. Um, and and we can hold other people to account for what they've said, right? Um, I mean, nothing ever dies on the internet. <laughs> you know, people screenshot things and you there are ways to find what people have said and, and that has come back to haunt people at times. Um, but I think also one of the things we need to get better at saying is, um, I was wrong, or that's how I understood it at the time, or I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, there are some things, um, there are, there are ways that we can learn to allow people to actually start somewhere and continue to grow, um, that are not particularly part of the public discourse right now. You know, we kind of, hold people in time. You said this one thing in 1994 and we're gonna hold you to that, even if you show a different pattern now. Now it's one thing if people show no difference, they're saying the exact same things they said then. Um, but there are times when people change and grow and learn. We're always hopefully changing and, and growing. So I think we have to um, really cultivate ways to um, acknowledge and understand what that, what change and growth means. Like instead of this, um, in American politics, we have this like, oh, you're a flip flopper, right? Like you, you change, you change what you think. And it's like, actually people should be changing what they think. Mm -hmm. They should be getting new information and then changing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so welcoming that, not expecting everyone to come fully formed, I think is, um, something that we need to cultivate more, but it's, it's difficult because it also, um, it challenges us to accept the people we once were, right? So we often are, are um, scared to remember the beliefs we had in the past or the way we thought in the past and realizing how we've, we've grown, um, does that mean we have to reject that, right? Reject the things that we used to believe. So I think we just need more space for all of that, especially if we're gonna have a world that just, um, you know, imprisons each other less, right? Like we, not only are we talking about abolition now more and more um, from physical prisons, but how do we just not lock this, uh, lock someone away because we think they've done something bad? They may have done something bad. Yeah. Um, and how do we then talk about how you hurt me or what you said that doesn't immediately lend to a defensive posture, but allows us to, you know, actually do a little investigation. Has this person changed? Are they, are they saying this, you know, what is, what is the reason they're saying this kind of thing, right? And do some of that kind of investigative work, but we have to come to that conversation with enough reserve to be able to have those kinds of conversations. And sometimes we're, we're not ready for that. Yeah. And, and Nikki, you've been talking about bravery, the, the, the absence of utter safety and bravery. Um, but um, one of our participants who is in fact, one of the welfare deans in our college has asked whether in terms of risk taking, is, the, is fear ever healthy? I suppose self-protection. Mm. Is that something that you ever think is it's right <laughs> and, and you should? Yeah. Well, I don't think that being brave or having courage is the absence of fear. Um, you know, there are things that we still have to do even though we're doing it afraid, right? Most of us are, st when we're starting something new, when you're coming to college, when you're coming, you know, to a new place for the first time, there's fear. And in order to actually move through the fear, um, you have to have a good sense of what, um, what the level of, of risk is, right? 
So, I mean, we have a very complicated human system that helps us navigate fear. You know, um, we have alarm bells that go off within our body. We have adrenaline that helps us go fast, um, that helps us, you know, think or get things done quickly. The thinking pretty much turns off, but we're able to do. The, uh, one of the challenges that comes from kind of the stress of, of modern culture is that many of us stay in that kind of revved up um, anxiety, fear place all the time. So the threat, our ability to determine threat level is kind of low. So I think when you're actually doing the work of cultivating brave space, when you're actually going internal and checking with yourself, you're able to say, okay, I'm having a fear response. I'm, I'm having some physical sensations perhaps in my body. My mental stuff is happening here. What is the actual level of threat, right? Is it something that I need to run from? Is it something that I need to take a minute and take a breath? Is it something that I need to attack, right? Um, if, if someone, um, you know, says something to me that I know is off, right? It's racist, it's sexist, it's homophobic, whatever. Is this, um, what is the risk level in this moment, right? What, where I need to learn how to evaluate that, that response I'm having um, so that I can respond appropriately uh, for myself. Um, and so I think that that's where, you know, the relationship to fear comes in is that um, sometimes that fear response is telling us um, that it's a very high risk and we need to get out of there, right? Um, if somebody is saying a slur at me and I'm alone in a dark, on a dark uh, road somewhere and I'm walking and I have no way of defense, well, uh, there's some, that is telling me I have a high risk, right? Um, if it's in a if it's in a classroom and I have other ways of dealing with that behavior, maybe it's a low risk. I'm still having the same response. I'm still afraid. What can I do? What where what's my where do I meet that fear response? Right. So I just think we have um, you know we have to figure that out right now in a time when like we're really learning to name harm when someone does something that is you know, a problem. Um, I think a lot of times with, with um, like sexual assault or um, someone even just like a dirty joke, right? Like we don't, we're, we're still trying to figure out what, where are like, how much am I being threatened? What, it, you know, the level of what this person did, is it the same level as, as, when, as if they put their hands on me? We're trying to figure that out right now because we're finally able to name those things, right? They're, they're not as likely to get swept under the rug. And so we're still trying to figure out how, what it actually is like to kind of courageously name it and then how to deal with our relationship with that person, um, what it looks like to hold them accountable. We just don't really have a huge skill set to deal with that now. It's either remove the person, they have committed all the problems, or it's just keep them in the community, right? And we just, we're still figuring that out. And so those questions are really real around threat level, fear, what it means to have courage. And so I think people that are committed to trying to figure that out versus just go into the scripts we have I think that's really, really important right now. And that's why I'm saying all of this work is complicated. It takes more time. Um, it takes us having our own kind of emotional, spiritual reserves. Um, and it's going to kind of look different depending on the people, the incident, the words, all of the things. Yeah. Mickey, I think we're going to kind of get out of time for the, um, because we've, gone on and um, it's very good of you to spend this time with us. Uh, these are hugely um, engaging thoughts which I will hold and take with me into the next academic year but I just wanted to end with a comment and thanks really from one of the participants who said what a way to end the week.
because we're ahead of you in time. So we are getting towards <laughs> the end of the week. And um, what a brilliant webinar. Thank you so much for sharing your time and wisdom. Um, somebody said they had high expectations, but it's blown away. So thank you um, and to us for making it accessible and peace and best wishes. So I don't think I can put it better than that, but thank you very much um, to the participants here. Next week, um, we will be asking a question which Perhaps it's a very different context, but in some ways feeds on from this, which is George Kroll, who is a Mansfield alum and um, has for many years been an ambassador in the former Soviet states and in Russia. And his question is, should we fear Russia? Um, so should we fear? Should we engage? What should we do? Um, and then the week after that, the final speak talk of this term will be Tristram Hunt, who's the director of the Victoria and Albert Museum, um, asking whether museums are, quote, the features of a free people. Um, so I hope you'll join us for those talks. Do sign up, do tell your friends, um, please share. Um, details for the next week's um, seminar are up in the uh, chat function. So um, do please join that. And um, I really look forward to um, seeing you next week. But in the meantime, Mickey, thank you very much for those ideas. We will take them with us. Good night. Thank you, Ellen.